Good evening, and welcome to Let's Talk Shop with Russ. And I had my mouse pointer right in the middle of my face. That's like really, really weird. <laughs> You're looking up at the screen and see your mouse pointer on your nose or in your mouth. So anyway, so uh, I hope you are ready to have a good time tonight. I know I think we are. I've got a, a loaded panel. I mean, they're not loaded, but they're a great panel. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, uh, but... Hope you're ready to learn something about turning. Uh, I've had a lot of people lately contact me, and also in uh, emails and a few PMs on Facebook. And then plus, I've been reading a lot in a lot of the forums uh, where people are asking questions about lays and tools and getting started in turning. Uh, and so I was like, you know what? I don't. I know we've done. I've had Carl Jacobson on here a few times, and. I don't know that we've ever really done an actual specific thing on turning as far as the uh, some of the tools and the costs. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to do uh, turning and give you an idea of what you might be looking towards. Uh, I know several people in here have different types of lathes. Uh, I know Charles has turned, uh, Rob, Daryl. I think Chris Ahern's got a... a um, uh, I know Chris Ahern's got a lathe. I can't remember the brand. I know Donna's got a lathe. Harbor Freight. Uh, do what? It's Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight, yeah. All right. So, and uh, Russ Meadows don't have one. I know he sold, he got sold this to Charles Deering. And then I don't think, Paul, you don't have one. Just shake your head. You do? Okay. So, Paul's got one. Okay. Well, great. So, we got a little bit more on here than I, uh, than I thought. But, uh, Anyway, that's what we're going to talk about tonight is about lathes, lathe turning, uh, give you an idea of what you will need to start off. And I just want to say right up front, if you are really considered about getting into turning, let me explain something to you. It's a rabbit hole, and it can get very, very deep as far as costly. It's all about what you want to have and what you want to do and what you want to put in it. Um, so we'll go with that for right now, but just be prepared when you decide you want to go after that, uh, follow down that path of the turning that uh, you might be a little surprised as to what you need, what you, ha uh, what you have to have, some of the things you really have to have, and then other things you can make up on your own. So Yeah, so they say your first project costs $1,000 or more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that I wouldn't doubt. I can't see uh, for some reason this stupid computer over here let me let me real I can see the chat but I can't see that we are, are live yeah well let me close that out and start all over and while I am doing that let me go over a few things that I need to talk about first off the whirly gig wars has ended um, I had a really rough time on a few people getting their information back on what they wanted so that's kind of going really a lot slower than I wanted I thought I'd already be sending out stuff so I'm down to the last where I can start out Monday start shipping stuff out that I have and and I'll be contacting the others and trust me it's taken me all week long to get responses back from a few people so uh, but that's over and done with and the so what's going on right now is the pallet challenge uh, the pallet challenge is running all the way through the 31st of this month uh, so if you need any information on that, go to simplywoodencreations.com, uh, go across the top bar over to challenges, follow it down to the 2017 pallet challenge. All the information you will need is right there. We're running real good. We're running about six or eight entries so far. We're still about 12 or 14 days. I think 12 days as of today, we're about 12 days out. So that's really good. And I believe we've got like 13, um, this computer over here is really, really wigging out on me. Uh, I think we got uh, 13 sponsors, and we're still actively uh, seeking out sponsors. If you would like, I'm, I'm hoping to keep my fingers crossed that these these last 12 days will have uh, a ton of people, uh, projects flow in for the pilot challenge. So um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I think we've got like 13, 12 or 13 sponsors and gifts so far, which is really, really good. So. Some of them are really, really good. Like Sterling Davis's Founders Choice Award is a hundred dollars in cash, and that's on top of uh, whatever you win. In other words, you could win first place 
and Sterling likes your first place so much or likes what you did so much, he could go ahead and assign that $100 to you. So you could walk out as a, a double whammy, so to speak, a double winner. winner. So uh, that's on top of that. But uh, we've got uh, Clean Spores got a really good prize out there. Uh, several people have got some really good stuff out there. T-shirts, a pen. I can't remember all of them, but a lot of good stuff out there. Also, uh, that's pretty much it for that. And let me go over on my sponsors, Devobel Technology for web design, development, hosting. Go to devobel.com. And next is FastCat. Um, innovative products for the professional woodworker. Go to fastcat.com. And I think my thing stuck over here. I forgot to hit the play. I noticed that Devobel didn't move. So uh, the next one is uh, Rocklear Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence with Rocklear. And last but not least, Bearwood Supply Company, bearwood.com. They have a lot of great stuff, including the Pegasus uh, scroll saw blades. He sent me some of them, and I still haven't had a chance to use them yet. So I'm hoping to get to that here pretty quick where I'll actually do that. Oh, one more little small thing uh, I'm fixing to open up and do that I wanted to um, tell everybody about real quick is um, I've got set up and I'm ready to go uh, on to Twitch. I don't know how many of y'all have heard of Twitch. Twitch is like a live TV. Uh, Carl Jacobson uses it. Uh, uh, Zach uh, Higgins from over at Envy Woodworks uses it for his pen when he casts pens. His little thing's called Dunkin' Junk. And matter of fact, you know, I'm in the money, guys. I got this from Zach. This is actually a casting, a Luma light casting with uh, shredded money that I got from Zach. So there could be like a couple of grand in here. Look at that. <laughs> it could be. I mean, you know. Yeah, you know try handing that to the cashier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you take that. But, yeah, there could be a couple of grand in there. But I got that. And that's from Zach Higgins over at, at NB Woodworks. He's on YouTube. And he does the Twitch thing. Anyway, this Wednesday I will be starting my Twitch debut. I'm set up and ready. And it's going to be we're going to be scrolling with Russ on Wednesdays. So I'm thinking about doing it in the afternoon to uh, make sure everybody's at home so they can jump on. Oh, by the uh, way, Rockler, if you're listening, if you sponsor me, I'll say your name right. Go yeah. back to you, Russ. No <laughs> 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 chasing you in don't, the chat. Don't Sorry, listen, I don't listen to him. Anyways, I had to say so, that. <laughs> uh, so if uh, you broke my train of thought, dang you. Sorry, oh. derailed. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> on Twitch, on Wednesdays, I'm thinking of doing it at 7.30 at night. Uh, from 7.30 to 8.30 or 9, and I'll be you'll be scrolling with Russ. Matter of fact, I'm thinking about doing the debut this Wednesday of the Pegasus Scroll Saw Blades, and I'm going to try them out live on Twitch. So uh, that's twitch.com, or Twitch is it Twitch TV, but just type in Twitch to uh, in your Google, and you'll go across it. And also, I'm under Simply Wooden Creations over there on Twitch also. So... My live debut on Twitch on Wednesday. I just thought I'd throw that out there so all y'all guys can come over and watch me on Twitch. Okay, so let's go down the panel real quick and introduce yourself. So let's do kind of a hurried up uh, introduction so we can get going on this. I'm going to start on my right, and that first person is Russ Meadows. How you doing, Russ? Doing good. Uh, stuff in my face at the moment. Uh, y'all can find me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube under Rusty Mills with a Z Woodshop. Great. And then next to him is Mr. Paul, Paul Corliss. Hi there, Paul Corliss from Paul's Messy Workshop. That's Paul's Messy Workshop on YouTube, Paul's Messy Workshop on Instagram, and Paul's Messy Workshop.com. And I appreciate you having me on, Russ. And how you doing, Daryl? Pretty good. <laughs> All right. That's good. And next to him is Mr. Rob, Rob Austin. Wow, you changed directions on me. Well, I'm I'm Rob Austin. You want to come see me instead of looking on the internet? You're gonna to have to drive over to my shop. You know, I don't have my own website. Well, I I do, but I haven't updated it in six years, so it's not impressive. But, you know, but if you want to look at that, it's Rob's Woodwork Woodworking dot com. So, great. Like I said, it's been seven years since I updated it. Here's your website. Yeah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I have to talk to you about how you update these websites. You know, my mind needs some rework. Cool. 
I uh, might be able to help you. And then next is Donna, Donna Presley. Hi everyone, Donna Presley, Donna's Wood and Art, YouTube, Facebook, and a webpage. Great. And then Mr. Daryl, Daryl Jones. Hey, uh, I'm Daryl Jones uh, of Dreadnought Woodshop. You can find me in most places where you get your social media content, um, particularly uh, Instagram and should be YouTube, although I've been pretty lazy lately. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Dreadnought Woodshop. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then Mr. Chris, Chris Ahern. Hey, guys, Chris Ahern at the old Cranky Workshop. Find me on Facebook and YouTube. And usually out in the shop trying to get this pallet project done. And I just wanted to point out, since uh, Shane's not here, that uh, um, Chris has on his thing, Chris Ahern, Old Cranky Woodshop, future pallet challenge winner. So just wanted to point that out, Mr. Shane Cole. I'll say it for him. Uh, Shane ain't got a chance. Huh? I've said that for Chris. I'll say, it, I'll say it for both of y'all. It's a random drawing. So. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> then my uh, co-host, Mr. Charles Deering. How are you doing, Charles? How you doing, Spanky? I mean, Santa, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm doing good. Woodenvisions.com, the Charles Deering on Facebook, Charles Deering. Scroll on YouTube, and we already have a question for you, Russ, if you're okay with it. It's about the pallet challenge. Uh, sure. Inspired Woodworks, I believe. His name is Chet, says, how much non-pallet wood can I use for my project? I have a piece of three-quarter inch uh by 10 by 10 inches uh material and a small section of cloth for the project okay <clears throat> your project and it says on the website uh has to be 90 percent 90 percent pallet you can use hinges you can use uh hardware anything like that but it has to be 90 percent of is that pallet. by weight no, it's by surface. <laughs> by surface. So I didn't make up these rules. I inherited them, and Sterling's been going by the ninety percent. In other words, he wants the majority of it to be. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what you're planning on doing and how you're planning on doing it. But uh, you know, ninety percent of it has to be pallet. So you'll just have to figure that out. On your own. <laughs> that's too. That's too much math for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to figure that out. So. In my opinion, it, I don't know. I don't know how much his project's going to take up. I mean, because if it's only ten inches by ten inches, I can't imagine unless it's a small project. Yeah, if it's just by ten inches, then he could have one inch by one inch cloth on it. So that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, but if it's ten foot by ten foot, then you're looking at you know more that he could have surface area that he could cover. So I mean, so I don't know what to tell you. Yes, Robert I'm Evans. Having, Sorry, I was I just saying, I'm having a hard enough time figuring it out myself because I know it's not by weight. Can you imagine by weight? <laughs> That'd be a heavy project. Jeez. So, but anyway, that's that. Any more questions out there? Because I'm, I'm right now. I'm dead in the water, and I just figured out why I'm dead in the water. Why it wasn't working, and I well, even my computer, and I shouldn't have had to reboot it. No, Robert Evans asked uh, if Chris won Shane's. Kiss drill bit system, and yes, he did. Hey. Cool. Yeah, what had happened was, and I forget about this, and that's the second time I forgot about it, is, is um, this computer that I'm using over here was in the house for a long time, and for some reason, it re wants to revert to the house Wi-Fi. And that Wi-Fi is so far away, it can't pick it up. It can do some things, but it just can't pick it up. You need and to go on... Russ, you need to go into your settings under your Wi-Fi, and um, I'm not sure what it is for PC, but for Mac, you go in there and you just hit forget, and then it'll no longer automatically connect. And I believe in Windows, you can prioritize. So you just drag uh, the preferred network up higher in the list, and it'll stop doing that. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to try something like that because uh, that's what it was doing, and I forgot about that. I'm like, I had a, one of those, duh moments because I have a wireless network uh, router right here in my shop just for that reason and so I finally realized oh I know what it is it's not picking up the router here so that's the reason it wasn't working so let me see if I can get back over there YouTube all right guys I'll get that up and running but Charles I got Charles over there watching the um, 
chat. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, lays and turning and stuff. Um, there are so many, and I really mean so many different lays out there, uh, brand name lays that are just like, it'd be hard to name them all. I know some of the panel members have specific ones, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about like right now. Uh, now, I had an old Craftsman for a long time, and uh, I mean, it, it is what it is. It was an old lathe. I turned some things on it, but I got news for you. It wasn't that great, trust me. Because when I got my new lathe, uh, which is the Nova, oh man, all the difference between day and night. It's like uh, I couldn't believe the difference in being able, that it made to be able to turn things. So um, you kind of get what you pay for in a way. And there's also uh, not only cheaper lathes and expensive lathes, but there's also what I would call not a mini, but maybe a mid size lathe. Isn't that what you would say there are, Daryl? There, are there many lathes out there? Yes, there's both uh, mini and midi. Well, usually mini and midi are uh, used interchangeably. Um, those usually describe the smaller lathes. And then you have the mid size. The mid size. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's several different things available. What you need to decide to do, uh, and that's pretty much the way it is the gamut of all this lathe thing is, is you need to decide kind of like a direction that you want to go in. Uh, uh, we're going to first start off with pin turning and talk about that and some of the lays. Um, so if you're wanting to get into pin turning and that's one of the first things you want to do, I would say uh, the mini or midi lathe is probably the perfect type of uh, lathe that you want to start off with. Uh, Rob, do you, don't ha do you have any mini or midi lathes in your shop? I don't think you do, do you? I have uh, two more or less mini lathes. Two midi lays and a powermatic. So I have a jet, a jet, a jet, a jet, and a powermatic. And a powermatic. Wow. <laughs> you have to start it off with that, you know, because that's the minimum for anybody that's starting off new. Right. Okay. And if you want to start off on pin turning, a midi or a mid lathe would be perfect for you. And they're a lot cheaper than the full size floor models, trust me, out there. So you know, uh, the mini lathe is um, like your medium-sized jet that uh, most people are coming out with now. Something like that is great to start off with because you can use that and you can make good-sized bowls. You can make everything with that in that one individual piece. Right. You know, what so size bowl? You start out with too small of a mini. You know, maybe six months or a year down the road, you're gonna want to get rid of that and get with something else. So if you're gonna buy a new one, I would go with like a mid-size before you. Uh, to start off with yeah if you do get one of the smaller ones you also if you're going to work on a, uh, a small log that's not balanced out have that thing bolted to your bench yeah yeah um, i have something to add to uh the uh the mid-size nova the 1624 uh, it doesn't have variable speed but they have it on sale for i think i saw it on sale for like 850 which is really a good way to go um, and it can be upgraded later to have variable speed. So, yeah, it's on sale for what you say, eight hundred fifty. Yeah, that that's not a bad price, not at all. No, and the thing is, it's got a sixteen-inch swing, uh, horse and a half motor. Uh, you could do a lot of, you could do um, a pretty wide variety of uh, projects with it. Right. Now, uh, I know Chris has a uh, Harbor Freight lathe because he said that, but uh, now yours is a full size Harbor Freight, though, isn't it, Chris? No, it's the MIDI. It is the MIDI? Okay, great. Well, how uh, how much does that usually run for the Harbor Freight MIDI? I got it when, with one of those great twenty five percent off coupons, so I think I walked out of there for just over a hundred bucks. Really? Yeah. Uh, but, and how and here's the hard part? Getting additional tools, the rabbit hole you talk of. <laughs> That's the hard part because now you're spending more on the the chucks than the gouges that <laughs> spend on the machine itself. <laughs> yeah, how I mean, you, I know I've seen you turn some stuff and everything. How do you like it? I like it. I'm already planning. I'm going to stall another year and get a, a better machine down the line. I think I'm going to learn to make my mistakes with this one instead of buying an expensive one and darken it up. Right. How long have you had it? How long have you owned it? About two years now. And it's worked great? It's, it works great. It, it's zeroed in perfectly for me. 
everyone says, oh, they don't line up right. I've had no problems. Right. So, so there you have it. All that I can say is you got to make sure you keep the dust, the, the, the shavings away from the motor because if you if they cover the motor, the motor starts to heat up some. Right. So, but I do every now and then I just stick my hand underneath and wipe it all away. So it's not been a problem at all. Right. Now, do you have the kind where you have to actually physically move the belt to different pulleys? Yeah, to, to for different speeds, but I don't. Oh, I, I have that. I, I don't care too much about worrying about the speeds for the stuff I'm doing. So. Yeah. I think I've had it open once in two years. Now, what? Uh, out of curiosity, what speed do you have it set at? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> About that fast. <laughs> That's good. It's still right where it was when I bought it. So. <laughs> That's good. I couldn't tell you. That's good. Okay. Uh, now, I know, now, Donna, you turn pins and stuff. What kind of lathes do you have? I have a jet. It's probably 10 to 15 years old that. You know, I got it new, but that's how long I've had it. And it's belt. It's got the belt where you change it. I usually put it on full when I'm cutting. And then when I go to the sand, we're uh, doing the uh, uh, super glue stuff for the finish. It's like I lower, the, I lower it down for that. Now, uh, you say it's 15. Obviously, it's lasted. So you must, yes. I mean, it, is it a mini or midi or a? Full size. Uh, I think it's a midi. It's like. Yeah, it's probably a midi. Yeah, it's not just for pants, and I have the extension bed with it also. I haven't used it yet, but you know, back then it was like fifty dollars to add it. I'm like, oh, add it to it. You never know. Yeah. There's a lot. A lot of people in the chat have a lot of varying lathes out there. Yeah, I, I've just got the chat back up, so somebody's got an. I have an old shopsmith. Yeah, that's what my dad has. Uh, a lot of good things about Shopsmith. Actually, two people have shot. Dennis, uh, can't see his name from here. Weld, W-E-D-L-L. -L. Uh, uh, I just moved out of my view. Uh, and, uh, he's got one. And uh, Ken McCrory, he said, I have an old Shopsmith, too. So, Yeah, these days they have the uh, digital motor on, yes. on the, on the uh, Shopsmith. Yeah, now I upgraded, which mine's a uh, full size, full size lathe uh, from the old Craftsman. I decided I got a really good deal at it from Rockler, uh huh, and uh, got a real good deal on it from Rockler. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I decided to upgrade. It was a a fantastic deal. Now I went with it. It's a, a little bit older model. It's the sixteen twenty four. And uh, the, but the sixteen twenty, this particular one came with the outrigger. So, Russ, yes, you have a twenty twenty four. Is it twenty twenty four? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, see, I don't even know what kind of lathe I have. <laughs> but he did get it from Rock Lur. I got it from Rock Lur. I remember that much. <laughs> All right. So it's a twenty twenty four. So anyway, uh, but it's great for turning bowls. But it came with the outrigger, which the motor swivels to the outside. So you can bring that outrigger around. I think it turns up to a 32, maybe a 36 inch bowl somewhere in that. I know it's 32, but I think it might be 36. So, so it'll turn up to a, that's a, I haven't, the biggest bowl I've ever turned so far was I think 16 inches. So I've never pushed inch bowl. That's like a number three wash tub. You can take a bath in that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it can turn pretty big size. I don't think it's 36. I think it's 32 if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to look. And maybe when somebody's talking, I'll pop it up on the on the thing, or somebody in the background has a chance to. I just I want to know one thing. If if Charles makes something, can I get half credit for it? <laughs> Since I gave him my lathe, I <laughs> traded scroll saw patterns for his uh, full size Harbor Freight. <laughs> now, yeah, I know you have. Yeah, we'll go to that real quick. I know you had the full size Harbor Freight there, uh, Charles. Now. You had some problems there with it for a while. Well, um, the the uh, pulley systems that one expands while the other one's uh, the opposite of that, I can't remember, shrinks or whatever, or they come together like this for changing speed, and one of them froze up, and then trying to take the pulley off, it shattered. Uh, but I eventually got another one, and Jerry Brown helped me replace that, and it's back back to new. I just got to get re-inspired to start turning again. <laughs> yeah. 
I think I read about that, and what the problem is is they make them out of the. Uh, it's not uh, cast aluminum, I believe. Yes, yeah, it's, it, it's almost like a plastic. No, yeah, I don't think it's cast aluminum. I think it is a plastic type material. And what happens is, is that material they made timing chain or timing gears out of those years and years ago, and they were stripping gears left and right and dipping motors, uh, automotive motors. And it's a fibered plastic or fibered cast. And um, yeah, and once it gets super hot, it becomes brittle and does exactly what you said. You oh, touch yeah. it, and it falls apart. It's like phenolic, I, isn't it? Uh, it's what? Like phenolic plastic. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, and I've seen them. And uh, Paul, now you have what kind of lathe do you have? I have two lathes. I have a delta midi lathe, and it's the kind where you adjust the belts on it. And I run it at whatever speed kind of looks good for what I'm doing. And I also have a really old Craftsman adjustable speed one that I very, very seldom use. And when we were at the the uh, woodworking show in Atlanta, Daryl was giving me a hard time because I never turned a bowl. And I just wanted to let him know I still haven't <laughs> turned a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he still hasn't turned a bowl. Appreciate the update. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Daryl. Nobody ever gives me a hard time. What's that like? <laughs> so you don't worry, have, I'll catch you up. <laughs> you have a. I was almost now at the Tampa Woodworking Show that Daryl went and I went and uh, Paul was there. So there were several of us there. I was really, really close to buying that Nova. What is it, Galaxia? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. You were yeah. drooling over that one. I think it got rust on it from you drooling on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I am really in all sincerity. I'm really glad that I waited now because I got a much better deal on the lathe that I've got. Um, I think I only paid sixteen hundred dollars for it, and it's like a thirty-two or thirty-five hundred dollar lathe. So I mean, I've got a really heck of a good deal on it, and uh, it works. I mean, I couldn't be happier. Uh, that DVR motor, um, I mean, it's just fantastic as far as I'm concerned. And I know we'll get to Daryl in a minute. He upgraded his too to a DVR motor on what his. What is a DVR motor, sir? Did or Digital variable, whatever. What is it? Huh? I think it's digital variable reluctance or something. Like I thought you yeah. record TV shows on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It. Uh, so in other words, it's a total digital uh, motor where you can run the RPM, and it, it, mine goes from I think uh, zero to five thousand, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. I'm like it, just like it's an incredible. I, I've never run it at that high. The, the highest I've ever had was about thirty five hundred RPM. And that scared the bejesus out of me. I thought the thing was going to take off. I thought the yeah. thing was going to take off and fly out the name of the door. It was making such a weird noise. But uh, but yeah, I can I can get an upgrade kit for my uh, Delta MIDI lathe to make it variable speed. But I figure before I spend the money for that, I just get rid of it and go to uh, a nicer full size lathe. Yeah, yeah. Once you started turning, uh, you will realize. Uh, that the full size leaves are really, really nice because then you have the option of now the like uh, Daryl. I've seen some bowls Daryl turn before he got his bigger lathe and he did some uh, like nice, nice bowls on his. When well, Inspired so, uh, Woodwork says he bought a bowl, it's much easier than having to clean a shop after <laughs> making one. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny right there. Hey, Miter Mike, uh, uh, we I sent you Miter Mike's out there in the I sent you. Hey. Uh, he said you sent him the wrong link. I sent him the link, and I, if he's not here, then maybe it's just not working for him. Okay. Well, uh, let me try real quick. Uh, Daryl, Mr. Yeah. Darryl, um, give us an idea. Let's go to pen turning right now. Uh, okay. I'm going to lock the camera on you. Kind of give us an idea, a rundown of what some of the stuff you're going to need for pen turning. Well, before I do that, I was going to share about my lathes. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you got the, you had, go ahead, tell them about it. Yeah, I have the, I started with the Nova Comet, which is the MIDI lathe from uh, Nova. And then I got the uh, 1624, the one that I was saying was 850. And I got two upgrades on it to turn it into a full-size lathe. I got the, uh, they sell a DVR motor upgrade with a computer control panel thing. So I have the same, I now have the exact same motor that Russ has. Uh, and the same controller. And I also have the outrigger because the head swivels. So you can do the, I can do up to 29 inches if I'm not mistaken. Um, wow. Yeah. And I also have, well, yep. Those are the, those are my two ways. Yeah. 
Uh, Jeff Robinson says that that's the same motor they put on the new shop Smith. Yep. Yeah, they uh, Nova is uh, apparently they're trying to um, get other companies to use the motor because it's a it's it's a different kind of motor. It doesn't even have winding. I swear I'm not working for them. I'm not. It's not an advertisement. I just happen to know a lot about it. But if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making any money from purchases. But if you want to knock yourself out, <laughs> <laughs> I love the subtlety on this show. <laughs> He'll have an Amazon link on his website. Just go. Yeah, twenty nine, twenty nine inch bowl is a big old monster. Yeah, but the biggest God, thing I think I've ever turned is uh, sixteen. Although I have a couple of eighteen and twenty inch blanks over here that I'm. Yeah, sixteen is the biggest off. I've gone. Uh, uh, Russ was talking about the speed scaring the bejesus out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, with the thing with the Harbor Freight is you have to turn it on to change the speed. If you have an off-balance log on there and it's mm -hmm. full speed, it'll it'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's trying to walk over to the shop and get oh, off. I'd like to point out one thing real quick is that um, I do know that uh, Nova is starting to produce those DVR motors for different things because Nova's come out now with that DVR uh, drill press. And Steve French has one, uh, has one, and I was out there and helped. Actually, I helped him put it together, and we played around with it. That thing is phenomenal, and then that thing will go like to five thousand RPMs, and I'm like, "What the heck are you going to drill at five thousand RPMs? I ain't figured that out yet." But it's nice because you can. It's got presets, but it's also got some presets you can set up for it. So if you're turning or wanting to drill through different things like plastic, and you know it's got to be. Uh, at a certain RPM, you just hit a button and boom, it goes to that RPM. Boom. But uh, back, back, let's go back to Daryl. And uh, uh, now that you've uh, gave your lathe and Nova plenty of uh, recognition, <laughs> <laughs> about that. <laughs> you can let's talk about what are some of the things that uh, you, we would need if we wanted to get into pen training. Well, uh, we got the obvious stuff. You have your, uh, you're going to need a pen mandrel, something like this. Um, I use a, a mandrel saver so that I don't have to use, don't have to uh, utilize, utilize the points in my tail center, and it basically there, it has a hole that goes all the way through. You're gonna have to hold it up higher. Do I? Okay. Yep. There you go. All right. It has a hole that the hole in the center goes all the way through, so it puts the pressure on the on your bushings and not uh, on the on the bar because it could cause it to bend. So that's one thing. Um, you also need, well, you don't have to have, but you're going to need something to press your pins together. Mm -hmm. Got to press here. Yep. Um, you really need to have a drill press or, um, you can buy, you can buy jaws for your, for your lathe. I actually have a set. Or, or a pin. Chuck. Sorry. Sorry. You buy jaws for your chuck, like these. No, it. Make sure you can see this. Higher. Right? And you can mount your blank hmm. in this, and then you can use a, a drill chuck, which I didn't bring over, to uh, bore your holes in there. But that's something that's really important, um, having the ability to drill a straight hole through the center of your of your blank. That's really oh. important. Sorry to interrupt, Daryl. Uh, Russ, uh, everybody keeps telling him higher. If you don't mind presenting him, I can hide the panel and he won't have to worry about how high up he holds the uh yeah i'll go ahead and present him to everyone that should take care of that okay the panel has disappeared yep okay. and then uh some things that uh that most people don't talk about is when you start turning pens you have a lot of you're going to do more than one kit right so all the pen kits come with part like a lot of different parts so what i started doing is started using these uh little tackle boxes like so and basically I have one, I label it here, I don't know, label it here for what kind of kit it is. Yep, man. You also notice, you see this, uh, this little green mark here? Yep. Okay. So they also use different drill bits. Some of them share the same sizes. So in order to um, manage that, what I did is uh, on this box, this is where I keep all the bits and the... Um, the end mills and things like that. So I have them color coded here and the size. And then where where I actually do it, paint it is on the end of the bit. Like oh, okay. so, right? Because this part never gets scratched up. Right. 
So that's important because, um, you know, if for for example, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to the uh, inside of your bushing here. You can color code this inside, and if you ever were to have the unfortunate experience of getting them all mixed up, you'd be able to you'd be able to uh, sort them out again. And the paint that I use for that actually is uh, fingernail polish because it fit the bill because it's tough enamel paint. Number one, number two, they have a million colors available, and number three, it's cheap. And number four, you had it on hand. Yeah. Literally. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I got to keep my toes purdy. But really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and it's funny that you talk about having them painted because I I don't know what bushing is which now. That's how long it's been, and I, they're all over the place, and I screwed up. I, yeah. I will point out one thing that I've noticed, too, and that is because um, I went through the gamut and bought me or bought me uh, my uh, thing for the uh, – I have a nice drill press, a nice jet uh, drill press. But I bought the stuff to be able to drill on my lathe also, the drill chuck and all that kind of stuff. But I do notice one thing, and it doesn't matter uh, whether you use it on the drill press uh, or the lathe. I have noticed that the drill press might be a little bit more susceptible. And that is you, a lot of times when people are having problems drilling through that blank and it getting off or whatever, it's because you're not taking time. You're trying to for oh no, a drill press is really bad about that. You want to just pull down on that thing and bore right through the uh, the blank. And what has happened is that drill bit will. Fall. I don't care how good you have. Uh, my son didn't believe me, and I proved it to him. How good you have that blank anchored, and how good your drill bit is, that drill bit will want to follow through that wood in the path of least resistance. In other words, the softer part of the wood, yep. especially when you start boring down on that thing and you will have an off-center blank. Now what I learned to do is just take real small, I'll go in just a little ways, back up. Uh, I, I keep a toothbrush is what I keep there by my uh, drill press, and I just take the toothbrush and brush the um, top of the blank and the um, bit to get all the stuff out. Go down a little bit more and take your time. If you take your time on a drill press, you won't have that wandering, especially if you marked it correctly and have it centered good, you won't have that problem wandering. Because I did a little test, and I pushed really hard one day on my lathe with the drill bit in the truck, and I had the same thing. It got off. And that's the same way. If you, The d advantage to having the drill on the lathe is you're using your, uh, what's the name, in that, the tail stock, yeah. and you're using that round wheel. You're not turning it. It's not like cranking down on that lever you're turning it a lot slower, which is causing it to be a lot straighter. But you still can get off if you don't take your time. Have you? Well, well cross, cross Cut Creations is saying he's been turning slim lines and other small projects. He wants to expand his pins beyond slim lines. What would be a good but nice second pin kit to use? My favorite pin kit was, one of my favorites was Majestic Squire. It's very elegant looking, but it's a pretty much a varying opinions for people, I guess. Well, I think a, a nice one to move up to is the, uh, let's see, um, Rockler calls it the Manhattan, uh, Woodcraft calls it the Wall Street 2, yeah. and <laughs> Penn State calls it the Gatsby. Yeah. It's a nice one. Um, and they're all the same damn to do. Yeah, right. the Gatsby. They're all the same yeah. bushings. And yep. uh, I have one of them right here. Oh, let's see. For your viewing pleasure. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Hey, Dow, is that like the Sierra too, or is it? I'm sorry. Little, the Sierra. What's that? The nib is smaller on the Sierra. No, Sierra is exactly the same except for the center band. It's got a different design. Right. Yeah, Sierra's a little bit different. I don't think I have one in here, but I, I like the Sierra. Uh, it's got that band in the center, and I like it. Do you have a Sierra there, Rob? Yeah, that. that let me still like. This is a Sierra. Yeah. Looking at the band there, that's about the only difference between the one and the other. Yeah, Alec yeah. Carter is saying the uh, Polaris is a nice pin. And there again, but you, I wish all the manufacturers would call them the same thing, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Some people will swear by a certain site. Yeah. I mean, I won't name any names, but there's one site out there a lot of people have complaints about. So, I mean, if they could just get all their names straight. 
<laughs> that would make it easier for people looking for certain things. Do they, cost, do they cost different prices at each of the different locations? Well, I think yes. they try to be competitive, but yeah, but for the most part, they're in the ballpark. But yeah, they do cost differently. Yeah, yeah, they there's they are about the same price, but like uh, like he said, they're almost. A, I've got I bought all three types and looked at them, and I couldn't tell a, a difference other than the name. The same uh, I was able to use the same bushings on all three and everything. Uh, Inspired Woodwork says Russ will run out in the bits. Or the chuck affected equally as bad, just as bearing down while drilling. Yep. Um, it can, yes, but the biggest thing that I discovered for myself was, and I did not realize what was going on, was I had a, a cheap craftsman lathe, or a cheap craftsman lathe. I had a cheap craftsman drill press, and I was having problems with it getting off centered uh, when I was drilling some of the bl uh, pin blanks. That what spurred me and I wanted a better uh, drill press anyway to go up and get a nicer jet uh, and I brought that home in my wife's Camaro by the way uh, from the, <laughs> the, Atlanta, the Atlanta show I brought it all the way home and, uh, and and then the jet when I started using it I noticed that occasionally I could get off on the jet and I'm going like whoa, whoa now I spent all this money on a nice nice drill press and I've got a uh, a nice uh matter of fact this is what i use a, a pen vise can help too well that's what i've got this is i'm going to show oh. you i've got a real nice pen vise this is the pen vise i use uh this was given to me by woodcraft oh i'm sorry that. russ we're still presenting uh actually i am presenting him but i've got it locked on me so i can see, see. Uh, sorry uh, and i put the little toggle bolt so it runs in the t or the bolts here so it runs in the t-track on my uh, drill press, I just slide it in. So this clamps it down and holds it really, really, really well. But I was still showing, and so that's when I started finding out and doing some experimenting is about the the force in which you and how fast you bore through that uh, blank. And by pulling on it hard and really boring down, it's going, the bit's going to follow the softest of the wood, and it will every time and in the grain of that wood and you'll get off if you take your time and like I said I go down a little bit pull back up get rid of the uh, I take a toothbrush and just clean my bit go down a little bit come back up just take my time and bore through I have not had a pin blank yet even on my drill press that I've messed up since I started doing that yeah bore not any blank sorry I thought you were done sir no I just say bore down on that sucker and try to go through in one shot all the way through it I guarantee you it's gonna go off Hey, don't, yeah, don't, was, do that. don't do that with acrylic because the thing heats yeah, up so bad. Exactly. <laughs> I, I almost lost a, a bit because it heated up and melted the built right inside the blank. Well, that no matter what you're drilling, you want to clean out the flutes of the drill bit anyway. So, I mean, that's why you're doing the up and down with it. I know. Oh, yeah, I, you, that's another thing. You want to keep the, the stuff will clog up in those flutes, especially if you try to go all the way through with one pull. And that's what it needs to do. A drill bit cuts the best. I don't care if it's wood or metal. Is when it can get clean itself, clean the path out. When that starts compacting in there, that will also cause the bit uh, to try to wander one way or another. So that's the reason I pull down a little bit and bring it out to clean out that stuff. And you know, go down and clean out the flutes because, especially if you're using a really, really hard, hard wood like uh, babinga or something that's really, really hard it will uh, have a tendency to clog up in those flutes and then it can't move out out the top of the um, of the pin blank and now you have problems with that too. Well John Schaffner is talking about twi twist drill bit versus brad point bit. I like the brad point because at least you know it's going to start where you want it to start. Yeah. What do you think, Daryl? Yeah, I would definitely, I would only use a brad point because uh, not only um, the wandering but the brad points, those two points on the outside, also ensure that you get a clean shoulder, which is also important when you turn a fence. Right. Uh, Rob? I use almost all brad points when I'm working on pins. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a whole selection of them for all the different pin kits, but yeah, almost all brad points. The guys, if y'all are wondering why I keep going back and asking Rob and uh, Daryl, these two guys I have utmost respect for. They know a lot about turning, a lot more than I do about turning. So. And that's the reason I've come back to them the most because uh, I respect 
what their answers and what they have to say about it. Trust me, I'm kind of a newbie myself. I have been doing it for like three years now, but um, I'm not done. I'm not near at the level that these two guys are, and have done as much as some of they have, as they have. And he clearly doesn't respect me, but. <laughs> I, I think you're a newbie like me, Mr. Deer. Uh, I'm probably less, more of a newbie. All yeah. I've done is pins and a few bowls. Yeah, that's me. I've done some pins and bowls, but uh, I've not yes. ventured so out. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Al Forte, I was going to say this earlier, but I held it back. He said, Babenga is my favorite sounding wood, and that reminds me way back when, when we did a show. To me, and if anybody out in the chat or anybody watching happens to be non-heterosexual, I just always thought it was funny. Babenga sounds like kind of a fruity magician. Babenga. Well, like I said, a hocus pocus or whatever. Yeah. Hey, I guess you had to be there, but I always thought that was funny. Yeah. All right. So we've got oh, a couple of things. <laughs> oh, but I want to go over uh, um, Brian Warner says, What lube do you use for acrylic? I don't use any lube. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's. Oh. I skated the line. You jumped right over. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I was also going to say the International Association of Pin Turners. They have a comparison chart of the different styles of pins from different companies, so you can see which ones use the same bushings. That's ah, very good okay. to know. That's really good to know. I need that to was International Association of Pin Turners. You said. Yeah, International Association IAP. Okay, Wacky Woodwork said something. I'm trying to figure out what he means. He is, and see if you guys uh, figure this out. He says, with acrylic, you should back of the angle of the bit, and you will get a cleaner cut. Okay, I'm not sure what he's saying about that. Me neither. Yeah, so you're going to have to rephrase that, because I don't understand what you mean. You should back the angle of the bit. Uh... <laughs> Tom spoke after I said that about that. He, he said his cheeks just <laughs> Yeah. I debated whether or not to read that on the air, so I didn't. Yeah, well, I'm yeah. not gonna go any further with that one. <laughs> well, I, I had uh, Mark Christopher's nipples on my show last night, so pretty much anything goes. Uh yeah, the bingo is cool. I prefer a hundred and eighteen degree jobber tip. Okay, I have no Brian Mortar saying I prefer a hundred and eighteen degree Jobber tip. I don't know what that is. They, Rob, Daryl? Nah, nothing to do with pin turning. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Sounds familiar to me. Yeah. yeah. We might be calling the same thing, a different name, but uh, I don't recognize that. <laughs> that other question you were talking about, uh, about the brad point bit and acrylic, the most important thing about acrylic, when you get down about 95% of going through, I pull the, bl the bit out so it's all cleaned out, and then I go through about a tenth of the speed, really slow. And when I'm actually cutting the acrylic blank, I cut it almost a quarter inch longer than what it needs to be. Because mm -hmm. almost every time when you put pressure on it and you get to the end, it's going to pop and you're going to leave a section out. So yep. if you cut it about a quarter inch longer, then you can sand it to that point or cut it afterward. Yep. And you don't have to worry about it. Because I'd say 95% of the time, even when I'm being careful, it'll pop the bottom of that acrylic uh, blank. And out. I, I right. think in some cases, Rob, that because I've, I've had that problem too, but on, in some cases, I think it's the uh, the type of acrylic because they have different levels of it. I don't, yeah. can't remember all the names. That and uh, the manufacturer, I've seen that make a difference on what will pop out. It'll like you'll get almost all the way through with the drill bit and it'll just blow out the bottom of it. It's like, Dag Nabbit, I can't use that blank now. There's yeah. several acrylics that are really brittle. I'm, I'm making a lot of them that are these ones here. I don't know if you can see these. This is a guy in a club is doing the acrylic blank so he puts whatever i want on there you know on there as far as uh labels and he has a couple of different types of resin he puts on you know he this one i don't know if you can see it from there but it's uh he's got it as a 50 dollar bill wow cool but he, he prints them out on a label on a seat of uh labels and then puts them on the pin on the blank and then pours the resin but i've had a lot of them that he's made for me i this is one that looks like a cross, you know, in the sky. I'm not sure well how well you can see any of these. Yeah. And Rob, does he use does he use that kit from uh, Arizona? No, he's not. No. No. The, uh, the I, angle I question he asked earlier was re referring to the 
the tip of the drill bit being at an yeah. angle, but Steve would, French is saying, sorry. No, I just, uh, I, I just was reading that too. That's, he means the tip, uh, the angle of the drill bit tip. Okay. And Jeff Robinson is wanting to know uh, what chucks uh, do we have? We will get to that in just a minute. We're going to mm -hmm. move on from pins. I'm only going to spend, we're already at 8.54, but uh, I don't have to, we don't have to worry. We can run over if we want to. And uh, I think this is going to be one of those we'll go a little bit over since we got so much ground to cover. I can uh, show yeah. you examples of the chucks when it comes to that point. Oh, right, yeah. I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> just a bit. I've got a few and Daryl's got a few too. So we're going to get ours in first, Rob. <laughs> okay. Well, if we run out of time, give me a call. No, <laughs> we're going to run out of time. Um, I'm going back. <laughs> Uh, Jay's talking about the angle at the tip of the bit. Uh, this, all right, Steve French is the steeper the angle of the bit tip, the more it's going to wander and follow the uh, grain. That's the reason the force bit, bits have almost zero veer. Okay, that's good to know. I did not know that. Uh, you won't have that with a brad point, though. A brad point, you're going to have three tips. They're yeah. all going about the same point. At the same time, the center one a little farther than the other two, and you'll have a clean cut all the way through. But yeah. if you weren't using a bread point, you could change the angle on it, and that's going to make a difference on how much it pulls the the bit through the your stock. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, that's what he's talking about. That has to deal. That's dealing more with uh, uh, not brad point. I don't know that brad points have angles. No, you can't change it. Yeah, you can't change the angle on that. So. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, I was just going to say Wacky Woodworks, which I believe is Dale Forsyth, says uh, acrylic cracks very easily back in the angle off the cutting edge of the drill bit and needs to scrape it rather than drill. As a, as a plastic fabricator, I work with acrylic all the time. That's why I thought it was important to mention that. Okay, cool. Very good. And then the uh, Brian Warner says we make calls from acrylic. We lubricate the bit to keep the inside as smooth as possible. Well, I have a question about that. If you're if you're lubricating the uh, the bit, what are you using that it doesn't interfere with the? What's he using that it doesn't interfere with the uh, adhesive? That's what I would like to know. What are you using as a lubricant? It don't come back with KY jelly. I was I was gonna say the same thing, but I keep muting myself. But you go there. <laughs> Wait for him or for her? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Oh, oh, right. we're on we're on par here now. Yeah, I've never seen a use for lubricant for anything that I've ever done. As, yeah, far as, as long as you take your time. wood and acrylic. Yeah, as long as you take your time going through acrylic or, or and I'll tell you another thing too is the alumalite, and that's what this money blank that uh, Zach Higgins uses uh, all primarily alumalite. And you know you were talking about Rob, you were talking about blowing up the bottom of the blank. Alumalite don't have that problem. Uh, I think it's predominantly in acrylics, and the reason being is acrylics are a little bit harder, so to speak, than uh, I think alumilite is. Alumilite might be a little bit softer, so therefore it's more forgiving because I've bored through these and never blew out the bottom of alumilite blank, and I have had that problem when I ruined a blank by cutting it too close to the size, and the whole bottom of it popped off, and my tube was, I mean, the tube would, would have been sticking out, so... Uh, Lumilite don't seem to have that problem that acrylic does. Yeah, the one that he's using, he uses two type, but Lumilite is what he's using on most of his blanks. Oh, really? Lumilite? Okay. I can't say what Ron Norris said, but Steve French said KY is water soluble, so you can yes. wash it away. And, and I was going to make that. I was going to, when we were laughing about that to begin with, I was going to say uh, you can use KY for a lot of things uh, because of the fact it doesn't, it's not an oily. It's not like Vaseline, which has an oily residue. Uh, it, Don't you know. hold your hand like that. Huh? <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you have to go there. <laughs> we cannot repeat what Rob, Ron Norris said oh, at all. It went off the rails. <laughs> oh, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it all started last night with Mark Christopher's nipples, and it's yeah. carried on. Yeah. That's went downhill ever since. All right. <laughs> Let's, all right. So we've covered uh, uh, pin turning. Let's get into bowl turning real quick, uh, which is kind of like the next, if you ask me, that's kind of like the next progression. 
and uh, hey, Russ, hey Russ, real quick, if, if people are using pen blanks and they want to use CA, get the um, the the uh, what the heck is it called? The HDPE ends as your bushing. You can use those, but I've never, had, to be honest with you, I've never had a problem with that. I've had a lot of. The CA glue sticking to the bush metal bushings and then breaking and having problems. I've never had that problem, but yeah, HDEP is what For you're anybody doing. who's interested in seeing what they yeah. look. There you go. Hold, hold on, lock on to you again, Daryl, and you hold it up. Yeah, those are HDEP, if I'm not mistaken, right, Daryl? Yeah, yeah. And what those are is you put them. I actually, what I don't think you put them on when you're turning. You insert them just before you start yeah. the CA glue, right? Yeah, after you sand it down and everything, and you want to do your your uh, your finish, your CA finish. Right. You stick them in the ends of your blanks to keep the CA glue from sticking to them. I, I, just, right. I just think I just when when I've done it, I just get a better, uh, cleaner, crisper end on the end of the blank. Right. HDPE ones. I mean, yeah, my 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 bushings don't really get stuck to it so much. It's just that. It just it look it seems like it comes out better. I just take a little piece of sandpaper and lay it down on my table, and then take the blank and just rub across the end of it. Just like a I won't use a rough grit like a 220 or a 320, and just rub it across the uh, uh, sandpaper a few times, and it smooths the end of that blank right off. That's how I do it. Yeah. So, uh, Rob, any suggestions? Yeah, don't use the CA, but yeah, now my, you know my, my preference. I do not like CA as a finish. If you're looking at it and you look, I don't have two here, but if you look at two together, I did some of them with uh, Bacotti, and it was a really nice looking wood, a lot of grain, and I did some with the CA and with some without it. And when you get done with the one with the CA, you look at it; it does look like it has a plastic finish. So putting the CA finish on wood does not give it a a natural look. You know, yeah. you're not going to get a wood sheen or the shine or whatever that you get from there. I stay away from CA unless I have a problem. If I'm turning a pin that's a burl and a chunk breaks off, well, then I put, you know, the CA on it and I pack the sawdust all into it. And then I sand it and it looks pretty consistent with the rest of the, of the burl. And then I'll put a CA finish on the whole thing because I don't want to have a shiny spot where that hole was at and go from there. But I do not use CA. Some people really prefer it. They do it on almost every pin. Right, then what do you use as a finish? I use uh, Mylan's friction, uh, sanding sealer, and then friction polish on top of that. Mylan's? Mylan's. Hmm. Okay. It, it's just a brand name. It's, yeah. old, you know, Woodcraft and, you know, some other places. I think Rockler had it one time. I should you can use uh, automotive wax. I, I've used different things on, on uh, you know, on pins is all I use it. I know. A bowl, most of the time I'm, I'm using, you know, some sort of a lacquer finish, but, you know, I use a regular Johnson's paste wax on a lot of bowls. That's what yeah. uh, Crosscut Creations is asking, if not using CA finish, what finish can you use? Uh, some people, what do they call that? They call it uh, something juice, but it's, juice. yeah, denat denatured out. Well, of course, that's more so for bowls. Yeah, that's more so for bowls. Uh, they make several different friction finishes, uh, and I'll be darn Daryl. What are some of the? Fr uh, can you think of a friction finish? Shell wax is one. Yeah, I don't know. I use. Uh, I make my own shine juice. Now, as a matter of fact, I was going to add to that. Uh, I use it on pens, um, and one thing that I found that works out really well is if you use a friction polish on a pen, just follow up with a little beeswax. Because uh, I find that the uh, when I do it without the beeswax, uh, it seems like the the finish stays tacky a little bit too long, and you end up with fingerprints in it. It dulls over time, but if you put a little beeswax on top of it, it takes care of it, and I, it still feels like wood. Yeah. I actually use a carnauba wax. The, the, the beeswax is tacky. Mm -hmm. It ends up with the same results, but I put the carnauba wax on it, it. I've got little pieces that you know maybe a half inch by half inch. I can put a mark across there and do it and then take it off and it hardly takes anything off the wax. It just gives it an extra layer of protection when you're holding it. Yeah. Now I know that HUT makes a, uh, uh, H-U-T makes a friction and I have a bottle of it out that I could run and go get. 
makes a friction um, finish uh, for you. I've used it on pins. Um, a couple of people I did the olive wood pins specifically said when we were talking about finishes when I first started that they didn't want CA glue. Well, they wanted the natural wood look, and I used that hut, uh, their friction polish, and uh, it worked very nice. And I've used it on a few other things, and it worked very nice. So, all right, I think we've covered pins pretty well. Let's run over and start talking about chucks. And um, I know Daryl is dying, literally just dying to show off. Uh, <laughs> he got a ton of... Daryl, you just tell him about it, and I'm going to present you so you can show off your, your little uh, things that you got. <laughs> um. So I'm working on a little project with uh, with Nova, and they sent me a little care package. And so I have um, pretty much all of the chucks that they, pretty much all the chucks that they put out. Um, I have the, let's see, the Supernova. I had a couple of them before because let me tell you guys this, you know, uh, Easy Wood Tools came out with that one that has the quick release, right? Um, but I can tell you for sure that um, having multiple chucks that you can put an put one set of jaws on and grab for a chuck with jaws, that's the way to go. It's not the cheapest way, but that's the way to go. But anyway, um, so I have the, let's see, I have, a super, I have a couple of the Supernova 2s, the G3, the Titan 3, the Precision MIDI, and then I have one of the, uh, one of Infinity's, the Infinity, which is the, uh, the one that, it's just like the uh, Easy Wood tools, and to get the jaws off, you just push a little pin in the end of the, uh, in the end of the, I guess the jaw holder, and it pops right off. So, and I used to have a Penn State Industries uh, set. Now, I did end up selling that to Russ, but I did want to mention it, and the reason why is because it's a really good deal. It's uh, usually about ninety dollars. And it comes with a pair of uh, cold jaws or flat jaws, uh, however you want to call it, so that you can flip it around and do the bottom of the bowl. It comes with a standard 50 millimeter set, and it comes with um, a set of uh, pen jaws. Not pins like pen turning, but pins like for very small orifice, uh, you know, um, pieces. So for 90 bucks, you really cannot beat that. Hey, Daryl, will yeah. the parts from a a uh, Penn State jaw fit on a Nova G3? No. And I would not, and to be honest with you, I I personally wouldn't attempt to use anybody else's jaws on anybody else's chuck because um, no matter what speed you're spinning it at, if it comes off that, if it comes off the chuck, you're going to have a real problem. I would not recommend that. I would not uh, recommend um, using different chucks across, you know, interchanging uh, chuck bodies and chuck accessories from different manufacturers. I would not recommend that one bit. Most of them don't fit anyway. The alignment of the holes that you put the screws in are not going to fit. You yeah. can use the ones from the uh, Nova Supernova and uh, Sorby are interchangeable. Also record power. Yeah. So and Nova, Nova is interchangeable throughout the line except for the quick change ones. No, that's not true. The quick change ones, you can get a um, they have a conversion kit. If you guys are interested, I do have one. But they do have a conversion kit that you can you can um, basically it's a uh, this little metal piece right here on the bottom of this one. This is actually an infinity uh, jaw, but they have a they have a little metal part, and you just take your jaws and you put the screws through your jaws and into the little metal piece, and then you can use those. You can use your regular jaws on your infinity chuck as well. Um, also, something that you might not know is you can um, you could purchase the um, the different jaw holders to make your Supernova 2 an infinity chuck. Um, you just have to take the little spring clip off the back and uh, remove the pinions and then you can slide the jaws out and you can put new jaws in there and you can make it an infinity chuck if, if you want to do that. But it's pretty pricey. It's well over a hundred bucks. Now, know. did you show? I had to step away for a second. Did you show them the uh, chucks with the cold jaws and everything on them? The chucks with the cold jaws? Yeah. Uh, I can get one. Hang on. I, 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 I forget the name. 
uh, of the one that has the rubber pins on it. I think it's, I want to say long, long, long something. Long worth. But yeah. I like that kind of chuck. I'm just throwing that out there while I have two seconds to say something. This is actually a, a Nova chuck. I don't know which one it is. Oh, you got it. Yep. I got, uh, I said I had one right here. Oh, uh, my bad. This is the Nova chuck. And, uh, I really like this because I was using um, the other chucks that I had uses Tommy bars and with the old Craftsman. And when I uh, advanced up to a Nova chuck, which uses now this one, uses this one, but the other one doesn't. But just to be able to turn this and change it makes it super nice. Well, well, that's, that's uh, a G3 truck, chuck. Do what? That is a Nova G3. G3. Okay. Uh, so this is a set of cold jaws that goes on the front of your chuck. And what it can do is, like, if you're wanting to turn the, um, either smooth out the, um, all right, help me, guys. What do you call the, the, tenon, the, the tenon off the bottom? Yeah, the tenon, or if you put an inverted tenon, if I want to call it. A uh, recess. All right, there you go, recess. Uh, see, these guys know all the terminology. I don't know it. Uh, but you would put the bowl in here, and these little rubber uh, ends, which you can move up and down for the different sizes, We'll grab a hold of your bowl and hold it in position so you can turn the back side of it. Now, there is one thing that people, uh, just to let you know before you buy one of these, uh, they are marked on them, actually. This one says maximum RPM 600. You don't go cranking these things up, 12 or 1,500 or 2,000 RPM, or the bowl and pieces will go flying off at you. So this is uh, designed to go at a real low RPM, I think mainly because... Uh, these don't hold the bowl, wouldn't hold the bowl at a real high RPM. They're designed to hold it a little real low just so you can smooth out the bottom, turn off that tenon or uh, whatever. But that's that's my uh, Nova Chuck with a set of cold jaws. And then the now, other Russ, are you aware of the fact that they make uh, a different style of bumper as well that has a, they're square and they have a taper that. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't have any of those because that's what they sent me. Uh, I got some free products myself from Nova for, uh, I won't go into it, for, but for a few things. Now, this is the newer Nova chuck that I have. Supernova 2. Yep. And it uses, is a little bit different. I don't know why they changed up, why they didn't keep one or the other, I'm not sure. Because that one has integral uh, pinions. The the little round thing that you're putting it into, uh huh. It's uh that's the pinion, and if you actually took it apart, which I've done before, it looks just like the end of your G3 chuck, with ah. the little pin and the gear around it. It looks just like it. I'm not sure what the purpose was. I know that uh, they're real proud of the fact that the back is sealed up, so maybe that was the purpose, so they could seal up the back of it. Um. Now these are called. Uh, there was one thing I would like to point out. These are called uh, the ones are called insert chucks, and what that means is this is a specific size, and then you can buy the insert for the type of lay that you have, so it will go fit different lays uh, in case your threads are different on your lay. So these are called insert chucks, and this is the. Uh, this is actually an insert that goes in here that fits my Nova lay that goes into the chuck right here. It's got a little um, Allen screw on it. And the reason I want to point that out is because um, I looked at that Allen screw and I'm like, what the heck do you need the Allen screw for? So I, <laughs> I snapped this on my Nova lathe and put me a chuck a chunk on here and crank that sucker up to like 3,000 RPM. Well, uh, I had the brake. Um, the Nova DVR has a braking system. So what happens is as soon as you hit the off button, it's it will slow it down for you, in other words, uh, rather than it just sitting there and continue to spin. Uh, so the first time that I turned me a big chunk and I had me a nice little like 12 inch bowl or whatever, and I hit that little off switch, uh, and the brake hit. This thing literally started coming off of the 
spindle of the lathe and coming at me. If it had not been for the, uh, uh, not the tailstock, the tailstock. No, the t uh, the Lighting. tool rest being in front of the bowl to catch it and stop it. That sucker would have flew right off the end of the the end. So I really quick like went, ooh, that's what that set screws for. <laughs> Yeah. Is, is that the true story of how you messed up that one bowl? No, no. I didn't, I mean, <laughs> that one just come flying off on its own. But uh, no, yeah. the bowl that I was doing wasn't, it didn't mess it up. It just come up and as soon as it touched the tool uh, rest, it just stopped it. But had I not had that tool rest there, it would have come right off and went flying. Now, uh, Russ, I have lost that you, didn't mention. you see that little hole? Hold it up again. Yes. You see the hole in the body of the chuck? This? Yes. You need to also put a set screw in there to yes. lock the chuck to the insert. Yeah, yeah. I, after that little fiasco, I learned what those are for. Okay. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure you knew. <laughs> I didn't. I was like, oh, you don't need no stink. I don't need no stinking set screw in my. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing it's for is to use it in reverse. Yeah. Yeah, if you would decide you wanted it. Rob, I see you. He's antsy to show off his uh, what you got? Uh, I was just going to show you. This is a Vic Marks version. It does have the angles in there, so it holds it in there better. And its RPM is put a max RPM of one thousand with this. Okay. Because instead of the ones that you've got, I, I have that same one, but this one instead of pins being straight out, these do go in. This is a harder plastic. Okay. You know, or it's a hardened rubber, but it goes in there. That'll hold your bows in a lot better when you put it on here and. You know, it's just like yours, but it's just a different brand. Is that uh, now? Is that the what's? Uh, I think Daryl's going to get the ones that fit on the Nova. Uh, but the name of the Chuck and the uh, is the Chuck name of what is it? Vic That's Mark. my brand. Is Vic Mark, right? Yeah. Right. The the Chuck and those jaws are both of Vic Mark. Okay, Vic Mark. All right. So, is that what you were talking about, Daryl? The square ones? Yeah. These are them. I get the bag open. All right. So, so oops. these are a harder rubber, like um, Rob was saying, and the same shape. And these go on your uh, on your uh, Nova cold jaws, flat jaws, same thing. Okay, cool. And it's, that's probably the reason why uh, the speed you can get the speed up higher is because you have a better grip on it. Because when you use those the straight pins, they don't hold that well. I also yeah. saw online that there was a guy who made his own. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's uh, it has aluminum posts, and it has uh, basically like a, a vinyl, a vinyl. It looks like a section of vinyl hose, but yeah. instead of the way that uh, the straight posts for most chucks work, um, so the screw goes through the through the aluminum, and it's you're able to cinch it down super tight um, without effect, without causing the uh, rubber to bow out so and on top and plus that when the uh i'm trying to explain this right uh the shaft is is stiff so when you tighten it up it doesn't flex like the rubber ones do i'm not sure what his name is i'm not sure who it is but uh they look really interesting i may be uh, ordering some of those i just wanted to point out that you know that's out there cool all right, so we went over chucks. Um, let's go over some tools real quick. And uh, I've got a few. That, um, now, these particular tools, um, these are the Rockler. 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 Uh, version of the, uh, the carbide set. Now, this is for pins. So you have the rougher for the pins. You have the uh, smoother or the uh, finisher which is round, and then you have the detailer um, for the pins. And I want to tell you, I really like these. I've got a uh, set from the other tool company that I don't like mentioning their name. Uh, they're supposed to be like really great carbide tools, and uh, I like these a lot better, to be honest with you. These are, uh, ha uh, the handles are a little bit heavier, and plus this rubber on the end, they just feel a lot better and those other tools so uh um yeah this was sent to me uh rockler so 
I really, really like these for turning pins. And they're, uh, you can catch these, this actual whole set, all three of these on sale every once in a while for less than a hundred bucks. Matter of fact, they're on sale right now. Huh? They're on sale right now. Yeah, for like 80 or 90 bucks. I think it's right around 100 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, 80 or 90 bucks. So it's right around 100 bucks. So yeah, you can catch these on sale. And that's, this is all in the world you will need uh, to turn pins. Debatable. Well, you can go. <laughs> to, yes, I, I'm, not, I'm not agreeing with that one either. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm talking about for <laughs> carbide. I know you can use a, the <laughs> conventional tools to turn uh, pins with, but this is for the carbide. This is really a great set. I like how they also flat. These are not, even though they're round, they flatten the back side of these. Uh, so they fit on your tool rest nice and flat. I like that. Uh, now, I have a comment about those too. Yeah. Um, you know, when people come and they go, well, you know, I'm, you know, I want to get started. You know, I recommend the the carbide tools. Uh, but the thing I do recommend also is I also I recommend that people go with instead of the small size like what you just showed, go with at least the middle size. And here's the reason why: you can do you can do pens and bowls and everything with the full size tool but you can't do bowls with the little tiny tool so at the very minimum if you're just starting out and you're not exactly sure how deeply you're going to go in there at the very minimum get the medium sized tools because you would be able to turn uh, a smaller size bowl any pretty much anything that you're likely to turn on a mini or midi lathe you should be able to turn it um, using the uh, middle size tool but now, using the small ones you can't now these are my full size, and I made these. Uh, I have the uh, two of the. Uh, well, they're actually a. This one is like a, a square, uh, or ninety degrees, and this one is actually like a seven degree, I believe it is. But there's a difference. They're not totally. Um, this one's square. This one's not. This is what I use for roughing, and I you can use an, actually this on finish finishing and I have a round one also that I wasn't able to bring in I didn't have but I actually made these these are made with a hog mahogany is the outside wood and then the center is a uh, actually a uh, hickory I want a real hard wood and this is just a copper fitting uh, that you can buy from your uh, from Home Depot and uh, I have a video up on me making actually one of these I don't remember which one but uh, these work fantastic I love these and then I have, I brought a few, just a few things in. Now, this is when you're turning the um, insert on the back of your bowl. I, I bought this and uh, I tried it and I didn't really, I didn't really like it. It just felt, it didn't feel good. It felt funny. So I looked at it and went and lo and behold, I found a video from the Gwinnett Woodworkers um, and the guy made one out and I decided, hey, I'm gonna get it. I went to home or Harbor Freight and bought an old screwdriver and I made my own out of the screwdriver and I love this for turning the inserts into the bottom of the bowls. This works ten times better than this does. I There's mean, a reason for that though. The uh, the one you have in your left hand, if you're going straight on the back of your chuck to make I, I have that one. I use it on almost every one of my bowls there. But if you're going to put that reset in using that, you're, you're going to hit your uh, tailstock and all the stuff on it. Because when you we get in there, everything's in the way, and you have to hold it at an angle, where the other one in your right hand is made so you can have more of an angle to approach it to get in there. Yeah. So that was Mike Peace from our club that made that. Yeah, I, and I love this thing. I was like, I made it out of a Harbor Freight screwdriver. I just went down and spent yeah. Two bucks on a Harbor Freight screwdriver and made it. And I saw it off the Gwinnett Woodworker thing. And I love this. And I spent like 25 bucks for this stupid thing. And I don't even like it. So uh, that real quick. And then my friend uh, Daryl there taught me into getting this nice. I love this parting tool. This is a nice parting tool. Remember that, Daryl? We got this in uh, Atlanta. Yep. I got one just like it. Yeah, I bought this in Atlanta. And then uh, Russ, Russ, them. <laughs> Russ, my computer blue screened. I can't get the chat or the watch page to work, so somebody else might have to cover questions. Okay. And then these are a couple of scrapers that I purchased. Uh, these are Stone Mountain scrapers. Uh, these scrapers are used for the bottom of the bowl. Uh, I used to smooth them out. 
uh, so small one or a large. I'm beginning to really start to use this large one, and I really like it even on smaller bowls because this thing's a beast. And then the other day, um, when Daryl and I did the Maker's Fair last year, he used to, uh, I was having a problem um, roughing something. I don't remember what it was. And he gave me one of these big, his big scraper like this. And said, you can actually use this to scrape. And I loved it. So the other day, I, um, or not scrape, rough. And I used this the other day on a bowl to rough it in a little bit. And I was like, oh, I actually like this thing, man. It's such a beast. I mean, that's, this is awesome. So I'm not, that might be my new rougher right there. It's not only a scraper, but a new rougher. And then I have uh, a small, medium, and large uh, bowl gouges. So uh, these are just a few things I just brought in to show the tools because, um, guys, once again, uh, we'll go down, um, take a guesstimate, when we talked about this thing being a rabbit hole, it is a big rabbit hole. Let me tell you, you uh, like one of these bowl, uh, one of these scrapers. This one right here, for instance, I think this was like a hundred and twenty, hundred thirty dollars. Wasn't it, Daryl? No, not uh, so. Much. Yeah, the Robert Sorby one that I have was over well over a hundred bucks. Yeah, that, that one's under a hundred there. This one's under. Okay, but let's say all right, let's say ninety bucks. When you start adding up the fact that you're doing. Um, you're buying a set of lathe tools. It doesn't take long at ninety, a hundred dollars a plaque to tie up some big money in some of these things. Yeah. So um, I'd hate to think of how much money I have in lathe tools. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm. I'm thinking. Thinking. I don't know if you remember seeing my display of lathe tools. Yeah, yeah, you can bring it over. It's on wheels, isn't it? So you can wheel it over. No, I'm, I'm, I, I can bring the camera over there without getting you too dizzy. That's not like Rob wanting to show off his tools. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. <laughs> Rob, don't do that. Okay. While he's doing that, my favorite kind are uh, carbide and Tommy G Workshop is where you can get them. TommyGWorkshop.com. Yeah, Back to you, Rob. Uh, before it's over, that if you wanted a good set. But uh, Leah, look at all those lace tools. Good wow. and ugly. Yeah, there, there's more over here, but you know, I I try to keep them in the central area. Yeah. But I mean, some of them, you know, this one was about 140. You know, and it goes like that. So, yeah, you add them up, it comes out to a bunch. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then you have to have five lathes, see? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you just Wait, while I'm wandering around, I'll show you some of the chucks. There, there's 17 hey. chucks here. Good God. Holy crap. Who was the guy that invited this guy? It's too much money. I don't know, man. Well, you know, I was I was resting comfortably at the house today when you called and said, "Hey, <laughs> uh, okay. you said you have seventeen chucks, seventeen. Uh, what's some of the brand? that's excessive? <laughs> what's some of the brand types that you have? Uh, my favorite chucks are the Vic Mark. I've got four of them. I've got uh, three or four sets of Penn State. You know, the Barracuda is the Barracuda two, Barracuda three. I have about three supernovas, and I have some of the the big hurricane that's you know like five inches across, and then I had a little aluminum one that they had from Peachtree. They had it on sale, and I don't know why I bought it. I already had you know sixteen at the time, but it was only a hundred hours. So, yeah, yeah, it's a wormhole, <laughs> a rabbit hole. Or, yeah, that's that's the thing. Uh, uh, Daryl, how much do you think? Uh, now, this is not including the purchase of the lathe. How much you would just to get in pin turning? What do you think you're looking at to start off with? Mm, let's see, not counting the lathe. Yeah, not counting the lathe. And you already have a drill press. It's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a shop. You have a shop which is your drill press, and you have. And, but you just purchased the lathe, and now I'm going to need the stuff to turn pins. Um. I'd say probably maybe two or three hundred dollars because I mean you're gonna want to buy some. I agree. Yeah, you're gonna want to buy. You're gonna have to buy the mandrels. You're gonna have to buy several. Uh, uh, you know, you're gonna have to buy the drill bits, maybe a pin press. You know, there's quite a few things. So I'm figuring two or three hundred dollars easy. You can you, you can you can make a pen press. They uh, uh, Laney has one on his uh, website. Yeah, but this we're talking Actually. about. 
the person that we're talking about doesn't know how to do that. They well, okay, this doesn't count the kits and and the and the blanks and stuff either. No, no, yeah. I'm I'm including kits and blanks. Like you can oh, yeah. you can get some starter kits from uh from Woodcraft. You get them on sale. You can get them like twenty bucks, and they come with uh they got four different ones: the European pen, the slimline, the cigar, and the Wall Street two. And they come with the drill bit. They come with the bushings. They come with two pin kits and a couple extra tubes. Uh, Penn State Industries also has the same thing. Um, by the way, this is the best way to get started. You just pick a couple of types of pens you want to get, and then you buy these starter kits, which come with everything. Um, and if you do that, you know you could easily get going for two or three hundred dollars easy. You can get everything, pretty much everything uh, you need to get moving. Yeah, but when you're trying to uh, first start out, you can do real well by buying. All you need is a set of bushings, the drill bit, and your your kit itself. So every new pin that you try, you're gonna have to go out and buy bushings and a drill bit. Yeah. So if, if it's if you want to do slimline, by the time you get the bushings and a drill bit and buy thirty kits, you know, make a lot of that one until you got it down pat and then go to another one. I know a lot of people that like the different uh the little guns and stuff like that and you know the the bullets and stuff. But by the time you do that, you, you have to buy for each one, it's going to be a different kit. Right, yep. Do something common. If you want to make a lot of the bullet ones, make a lot of them. But if you just buy one, you know, well, by the time you get the bushing, the kit, and the drill bit, you've got almost $20 into it. So yeah. then the only thing is, if you just buy the pin kits alone after that, you know, you don't have much expense. But, you know. Yeah, every and that's another thing I was going to point out to you when you're turning pins. Every kit has its own set of bushings. So if you've got ten different types of kits, you've got to have ten different types of bushings. And now some of the uh, pin kits will use the same size drill bit, like the seven millimeter or the ten millimeter. But still, you there's like five or six different types of uh, bits that you sizes that you will need for most of your assortment. So. You just, I think Rob had it on the nail. Uh, start off with something like cheap slim lines. To me, are a perfect start off. Number one, the kits are you can get them for three ninety nine to four ninety nine a piece, and uh, depending. I bought a set. Uh, Woodcraft had them on sale a couple of years ago. You actually could get like a fifteen of the uh, gold, fifteen of the copper, fifteen of of the silver or fifth and fifth it was five different ones 15 of each and i actually you paid like 50 bucks for them but when you broke down how much you actually paid for all of them a piece they were only like a dollar a piece for all the pins that you bought and so i bought all of all those at one whack and i still have some of the ones left over uh, so that's a good way to start off with one pin one bushing one drill bit and like rob said uh, uh, work from there because it is a rabbit hole. Um, all right, uh, I asked Daryl first. I asked Rob. Uh, Rob next. If you wanted to get started in the bowl turning, what do you think you're looking at right off the bat? Well, I mean, to be honest, you could if you have a lathe. Most lathes come with a faceplate. Um, to be honest, you really could really just the cost of your tools and really the lathe because you can. There are ways to do it i mean but it'll quickly escalate when you start uh trying to upgrade because you could just mount a chunk of wood to the um uh to the face plate with screws right and you could turn uh turn the bottom flat you could glue on a waste block flip it over glue your waste block to the face plate and uh turn your bowl you could do it that way but if you want to get a chuck um let me try to think what else well, really, a chuck and, and flat jaws, uh, you're looking at at least 300 bucks just for that, at least. What do you think, Rob? If you get something like the, the Supernova, they're coming on sale for it's maybe $160 or something that comes on sale. And with the standard jaws, if you use a, your faceplate, like he was saying, to get it started and turn around, then you could hook it up with your, you know that chuck. You don't need much. I mean, the wood itself, you know, ninety percent of what I turn is from logs people give me. So you're not paying for the stock and stuff like you do in the pin blanks where you get exotic woods. So 
besides that, the only thing you're going to need is maybe a couple turning tools. You know, you, you know. I guess one thing you need to talk about is what you don't do when you're using. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying when when you turn the boat, you don't use a, you don't use a skew. Yeah. You don't use uh, spindle Spindle gouge and stuff like that. So the biggest thing is when you talk to somebody about getting started, you know, make sure they're aware of what's going to hurt you. You take a spindle gouge and you can uh, you can snap it because it's got a real small tang where it comes out of your handle. And it's great when you're going in a lengthwise position on there on on side grain. But when you're trying to do it like in the bottom of a bowl, it's so easy to snap those things off. I I tell them, sorry, Rob. You go ahead. I fell in love with carbide by tools when it came to to bowls because the right shapes do the right things. And I mean, I can't speak for everybody because everybody has their opinion. But the carbide tools, people people either love them or hate them. But they, they did great for me on bowls. Bowls. Yeah, I I prefer not to use the carbide for anything. I do have them now. They're great when I'm teaching my grandkids how to yeah. make pins. You know, when they're like between nine and twelve. I taught them how to make pins, and I started off with the younger age of using some of the regular carbide tips because they can just hold it straight and maneuver it around. But my grandkids all do it with a skew. Yeah, I've also noticed a lot of people, as far as feedback goes, whatever they started with is what they prefer. And I started with carbide, so that's probably why I prefer it. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I started with carbide, and oh. maybe, maybe what it is uh charles is maybe you just haven't you haven't progressed far enough because there there are things that you can do with traditional tools that arguably there are people that can do everything i mean some there's some truly talented people in the world that can do everything with carbide but i find that it's a lot easier there's a lot of things that uh i can do with the traditional tools that i cannot that i personally uh, have not been able to accomplish easily with uh, carbide, which is yeah. the reason why I moved away. Uh, yeah, no pun intended, but I, I cannot get a grip on the, the, the traditional tools. I, I can't get the hang of any of them. Yeah. You know, one of the main parts to look at when you're doing that, the carbide tools tear your fibers. You know, you're, it's a scraper. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people do use them, and, you know, I'm not criticizing them, but if you want to become a – if you're just doing a simple thing or something like that, the carbide tools are fine. But if you want to go to different type of uh, turning, finer turning, smoother, less sanding, you want to do it with a traditional tool, you know, because a traditional tool you're cutting, you know, you're going along with the grain and you're cutting into there. Where a carbide, you're scraping and you're breaking the fibers in there as you're going. That's a very and good point. The job can get done with either one. Uh, it's a matter of your preference. Yeah, you can use the carbide to to drill down real quick, take a lot of stuff off, and then go to the traditionals. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, in my experience, I, in my experience, I can remove. I've been able to remove hog off material much faster uh, using traditional tools than I can with carbide. Right. Oh. Well, I guess you could find it. Uh, um, this is obvious, but there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I mean, the advantage to a carbide tip, although it's scraping, is that if it gets dull, you switch out the tip. But you know, but there again, there's there's advantages and disadvantages on all of them, but. I mean, there's some materials that'll dull the crap out of your traditional tools. I know we were talking about that the other day, I believe. Yeah. All right, real quick, uh, let's go. Uh, um, Chris, no. anything else? Have you been listening? Or what, anything else you would like to point out? Or have anything else? Well, I was, I was going to try to compare Chuck's because I got the Nova 3, but you guys in size killed me real fast. So, <laughs> but, but I was going to tell people out there who are using the Harbor Freight, of course, mine won't come out right now. You got to get the adapter. Yeah. So, you know, the, the guys at Woodcraft, they close me up, it's a 40 minute drive down there. They go, oh, don't worry, we'll play on your Harbor Freight. Yeah, I get all the way home to find out it didn't fit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah you- get the adapter while you're in the store. Tell them you need, if you're a Harbor Freight user, I think it's ATPI. Yeah. Um, you got to get it up front because you're going to be frustrated. Right. But, um, the Nova, I swear by it now. I got two of them now. Uh, I I love using them. Yeah, Nova. I I really like my Nova uh, chucks that I have. But you're right, and that's the reason they call them insert chucks is because yeah. they will fit uh, a majority of the other lays. You just have to buy the insert 
uh, that fits your particular lathe that go inside the Nova chuck. So, uh, Donna, you got anything to add to what we've been well, talking about? Um, one thing is if you don't have a lathe but you think you might be interested in it, go take a class. That's what I did, like 2004 or something. You can do it at uh, Woodcraft. Rocker might offer the uh, pin turning class. You have the like the Atlanta Woodworker Show where you can go turn a pin, see if you enjoy it, and then get everything you need. And win the lottery. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I noticed that was out there in the chat, somebody said, and, and I think that's one of the things that um, there's several things that I think entice people for the carbide. <laughs> Uh, ease, to me, they're easier to use. I don't yep. care what any of y'all say on the panel. Absolutely. I tried with traditional tools first, and I couldn't get the hang of it. I went to carbide and I immediately picked them up and was able to turn. Second thing is, is just exactly what I'm reading out here, and is the amount of money in that rabbit hole because with the traditional tools, you have to learn how to sharpen them. And guess what? You've got to have something to sharpen them with. Now you're on a whole different subject. With the carbide tools, you can either, now you can sharpen the carbides themselves, or you just buy more carbide replacements and put on them. Uh, but each of those ends of those tips are, uh, uh, I'll do that real quick because I have, I think I have my card. Well, they're razor sharp, and there's also more than one side if it's like a square or triangle or diamond. Right. What you would do, all you got to do is on a carbide to sharpen them is you just take this little set screw out in the center and pull the little carbide tip square off and then you get you a diamond uh these come from harbor freight uh a diamond plate and put a little honing oil on this and just put your carbide tip flat down on this and rub it and i don't know 15 20 times take it off put it back on your tool and boom you're ready to go and another thing on this too is you have actually on the square one for a rougher you all have four sides one, two, three, four. So you can rotate this as it gets dull, then turn around and sharpen it, and now you got another four turns. On the round one, what you want to do is make sure somehow you mark the round one so that you can rotate it around so you'll know where your starting point was. When you get back to that, then you can sharpen it. So that's well, another it. thing. That AZ, AZ Carbide, I'm sorry to interrupt, Russ. Uh, AZCarbide.com, that has a little, I think, Others might do it too, but they have a little dot for you to reference where you are on that circle. Some of the bits are, depending on where you buy your carbides, they do have a dot so that you can keep track of it that way that is engraved into the... So that's another reason for uh, doing carbide is the fact that I don't have to buy a uh, anything. And I don't. And another thing is too, I don't care if you're, if you're not experienced and you get one of these bowl gouges, uh, and you don't have the right setup, you're going to mess it up real quick if you don't know what you're doing. Or your wrist. Yeah. So uh, that's another another little ping. I, I'm sorry. I love carbides. I yeah. When I tried traditional, I was yeah. jumping all over the place. Yeah. Well, Russell, what are you using for that uh, the lapping fluid that you're putting down there to uh, just the regular honing fluid like I would use on a uh, the lapping fluid like I would use for uh, my honing block my just a honing oil. Okay. What I discovered is that the stuff that you buy in the little bottles is like $21 for the lapping fluid. Mm -hmm. And I'm not mentioning brands or anything, but if you take your regular antifreeze, that consistency, that works just as good as a lapping fluid, and all you're doing is taking a couple drops out of your bottle of antifreeze. Yeah. It does exactly the same thing. And the consistency, we've actually asked the people that are make this stuff or that, that sell that, about the, you know, because the guy brought it up, is that really consistent with antifreeze? And the guy goes, uh huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like twenty one dollars for a bottle. Get out your little bottle of antifreeze. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, twenty one dollars. Well, I don't buy bottles. I buy it in the can. It's a honing oil, and it's not that expensive. It's only like five or six bucks. Yeah, well, paper that a pinch and pennies. That was dang good advice. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, another thing, the ones that are sold by Trend. <laughs> Hold on, just one second. I'll show you what I use. Yeah, I pinch pennies so hard they break in half. Yeah, the the one the bottle that's sold by tw Trend, I believe, is about twenty dollars for this plastic bottle that's not too big. I mean, it'll last you a long, long time, but 
antifreeze, I just go get some out of the garage and it doesn't cost me anything. Yeah, sure. And uh, another thing, I don't know if it's been covered, but light turning is addicting because there's so many different things you can do with them. This yeah. is uh, Norton. Yeah. But that's no 20 bucks. I think I paid like five or six bucks for that. Really? I, I know the one that was for a trend when I've gone out to different shows. It, it's almost $20 for the, the, the bottle that, but it might be a little bigger bottle too. Yeah. And another thing that I've learned is too is three in one oil. Three in one oil is really, machine oil is really the same consistency of this stuff. Actually, it's just clear like this. So I tried three in one oil last time because I bought a bottle of it. I needed it for something else. And it worked just as good as this stuff did too. But yeah, you use the, uh, the, this onto this for your carbide tips and it works, uh, works fantastic. Uh, and the, you can get a set, of, you can spend like $30, $40 for a set of these, or you can go to Harbor Freight and it comes in three different grits. I think it's six to uh, seven dollars, $8. Yeah. For six or seven, eight dollars. Yeah. They come in three different grits. They come in 180, 260, and 360 is the red. The yellow is the uh, two. I use the red predominantly for the carbide tips. And that's I've actually set up a little block, almost like a honing block, that this sits down in out there, and that's what I rub them over. And, uh, yeah, I, I've used these. I've had that red one now. I've had this set. I don't think I've used the blue one yet. It's never come out of the box. I've used this several times, and I use that red one all the time. And I've had this for this set for over a year, and it works great. And it's only cost me ten bucks compared to fifty bucks when you buy see them out there from other places. I know uh, some uh, Chris and them's going to laugh as um, about how much stuff I have from Harbor Freight. We they had a little challenge the other day. Every time I said Harbor Freight, somebody took a drink. <laughs> <laughs> In that one show. Uh, all right, uh, Michael. Anything you got left? You want to add? No, I ch I chimed in. Okay. And then, uh, well, I, I I know I keep relying on uh, Rob and um, Daryl for a lot on this show, but like I said, I respect their opinions, and I know they've done a lot more turning than I have. So, uh, Paul, you got anything else? Um, just the most expensive thing other than my lathe I bought was my Nova G3 chuck. Uh, and as far as tools, I just got cheap tools, and I've got a work sharp. And I keep touching them up, and when they get down to nubs, then I'll see about getting a better set. <laughs> uh, your workshop, uh, how much did you work sharp? Uh, how much did you pay for that anyway? I think I paid $139 for it. Really? That's yeah. a good price. Yeah, that's a real good price because those suckers run up there at two or 300 <laughs> Yeah, well, I've had this for quite a few years. I really like it. It's yeah. the, three, uh, the 3000, which is their top of the line one. And I've had nothing but good luck with it. Yeah. Yeah, there, I've heard a lot of good things about those. Well, guys, we went. Wait, I do have two things to share. Go ahead, go ahead Derek. So, one, the G3 Chuck, um, something that was kind of confusing to me at the time, well, back when I was first looking at Chucks. They actually make two versions of that. They make one that's a one, that's a, a direct thread for the uh, MIDI and mini lathes. And they also make the insert one. That's right. Yeah, yeah, in case in case you're in some in case you guys go out somewhere to buy one and you see that they have two different ones at two different prices, you know, now you know you know why. And then the other thing I have to share is uh uh when when you're doing pen turning, the the mandrel and the uh, the mandrel saver uh together they run about thirty dollars, but the other day I was in Woodcraft and I found this set instead which is really nice and it and you just mount your bushings on these two short posts and you can turn your uh, you can turn your pin and this is supposed to have uh, less of a deflection issue I was just gonna ask if you had a set of those and uh, have you used them and if so how do you like them well I have a set of these I haven't used them uh, because I've been busy doing other things but uh, I am I am looking forward to trying them but they did come highly recommended. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have talked about using those uh, because of the deflection. They say that those are called turning across the center. 
center so center. Turning between points is what. Oh, yeah, point. and uh, one of the things that I do know about them that is, uh, but you can only if like if you're turning a pin that has two pieces, you can only turn one at a time with that. Where right. Be on a regular one turn. Uh, only time I'm time I could see that you have would have problems with the deflection on those is that if you really crank down on that one end on the tailstock, I could see deflecting. But I've turned quite a few pins and I've never had a problem like with deflection. Have you ever had that problem, Rob? No, because I know how to do it. Huh? <laughs> No, I, I tell you where you do have problems. If you set up a pin and you've got like slim line where you're putting all your parts on, you put it all in. If you tighten that thing up tight before you put tension on from the back without bringing the tailstock up, you can bend that rod. Okay. You know, so if you just take it out there, you put it all together and you tighten that up without having the part on there where you got it stiff in between, it can bend the line and get the rod and give you a deflection. So okay, you I still stock up, tighten it down, then tighten it up there, and then you okay, tighten I see it. what you're because see, I turned the pin, and I ain't even got it off there yet. So you're talking about if I tighten this down really, really, really tight before I have my tail stock right. on this tip. Right, you're, sort of, you're stretch, stretching the metal in there on your rod itself. And if you look at it then, you can tighten it up by hand enough that you can bend that rod. And huh? once they get bent, you can't straighten them out, and don't ask me how I know. <laughs> um, I turn this. I turn this pin, by the way, and I have, uh, and I put uh, one coat of CA. And I brought this in in case uh, I needed to show how a pin manual. But I brought this in, and this is a little bit different than Daryl's. He has the tail saver. This one doesn't. So if you'll notice, the end of the uh, it's got a little point on it. So what you do is set this in and just bring your tail stock up and put it on here and rest it, and that holds this in position. So, It'll save um, you, you, you uh, that mandel saver that he's got there. It'll save from chewing up the tip of your live center. Yeah, I've chewed up a lot of tips. I just sand them a little bit, and I, I'll take them over to the uh, uh, sanding disc on a on a drum, and I'll put more of a little bit of a point back on it. So it really doesn't make a difference. I found when I was using the mandel saver, I got one. I only used it a couple times, but if I'm using a really hard acrylic, I wasn't able to tighten up with a mandel saver tight enough to keep from the, the your blank spinning or, or skipping a little bit, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. felt like I wasn't getting enough friction on it to hold it in place. So I, I stopped that, using it after a couple of tries. Well, I, had I, the, haven't, I haven't had that issue uh, with the mandel savers. I've been, I've been pretty lucky with it, but I did notice that uh, – I'm trying to remember what the problem was I had. I think it was, I think I didn't have the, the, these two nuts tightened down enough and this was. Oh, right. Tight. It I think that was the issue that the only issue I've ever had was that, but I haven't had any, I haven't really had any issues because really the, the bushings bear off of these two surface off of right. you know, this surface right here. So I don't know. I've had good experiences with it and uh, it'll, if you use this, it's very difficult to bend your. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Uh, I had one with the mandrel saver, but it went with my lathe that I sold, and it wouldn't have worked with this lathe anyway. This is a 2MT, and the old crap was the 1MT. And I decided to buy this just out of curiosity, uh, just to try it. And that's the reason I went with this particular one, but I am going to plan on buying another one with the manual saver. So far, this one has worked great. I've turned like 25 pins with this, just bringing my tail stock up, and I've not, not had any problems. So uh, I do want to say one thing before we get off of here, uh, and that is, and I will tell this, uh, don't buy nothing from Penn State. I hate Penn State, and I'll tell you that off the bat. They're worse than Lowe's ever thought about being. Uh, I, I order some stuff from Penn State, and to, first off, don't go their cheap, uh, their ridiculous price on shipping, for number one. Uh, don't go their cheap route on shipping because what they do is it goes from one carrier to another carrier to another carrier to another carrier, and I swear you could get mail quicker back in the old days with the horse and carriage or the horse, or what was it that ran across the West? Uh, 
Pony Express. Pony Express. Pony, you can get, I could get it from Pennsylvania to Florida cheap or quicker with Pony Express than I could the way they send it. So, and number two, if you have a problem, those are the most rudest people I have ever talked to on a phone in my entire life. Um, I re I ordered a uh, center thing for that older lady that uh, I sold uh, from them. And uh, I got an, and I knew it wasn't, I, I ordered it Pony Express. I knew it wasn't supposed to be here. But within about three days, I got a notification in an email saying, your part's going to arrive tomorrow. And I was like astonished. I was saying like, wow, this is going to get here quicker than I ever thought. Well, tomorrow came and went and the part never got there. So I went like, well, I didn't get it. So let me call and see. I called the lady and told her, I said, yeah, I ordered this everything and I got an email and, uh, but it didn't come today. And she looked at one and then she said, well, you ordered the uh, economy shipping. And I'm going like, yeah, I ordered the economy shipping. She said, it's only been like four days. And I said, yeah. She goes, you didn't expect to get it this quick, did you? <laughs> you can't say <laughs> and I said, Do what? And she goes, it won't be there. That's not. And I said, well, I received the email. She goes, we didn't send you no email. Lady, I've got it in my email box. Do you want me to forward it back to you? Anyway, so finally I told her, I said, you know what? I will never, ever. And that wasn't the only time I had a problem. I had a, I had bought a um, the uh, 30 caliber pen with the little lever mechanism and the lever mechanism uh, on the very first one I had was broken. I mean, it would twist around and around. You couldn't get it to stop. Call them about getting a new one. Uh, well, if you've put the whole pen together, you need to send us a whole pen. And I'm like, I ain't sending you the whole pen with my bike and everything else in it uh, and the tube. I'm not doing that. I took it apart and sent it to them. Then they wanted to say, well, apparently when you took it apart, you broke it. So I'm like, you know what? I've had enough of you. And you're rude, and I will never order. I don't care if a customer wants something from them. I'll say you order it, and if it comes in broke or whatever, you take care of it. I want. Now I don't know if, I'll, I, but I'll never order from them. I hate in state, and don't order from them. If you like me, don't order from them. Tell us how you really feel. Don't don't hold back now. Yeah, really. Yeah, but I'd like to apologize for Russ holding back so much. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but I don't know if I don't know. Most of these other companies like Woodcraft, Rockler, uh, a lot of these other places, their kits come from Penn State. I mean, when you get the kit that says PSI on it, you're buying it from Rockler, it, it's coming from Penn State because they are kind of like the people to deal with as far as pens. But the point is, I would rather buy it from Rockler or buy it from Woodcraft or buy it from somebody else because they will honor if there's a problem, like I had a problem when I bought one from uh, a rocker store, took it back, they exchanged it without any problem, no fuss, no no problems whatsoever. And you can order them online from those companies too. I know you're probably still contributing to Penn State, but I I tell you what, I wouldn't, I don't care if I was dying, I wouldn't order water from them. Yeah, customer service is big. Yeah, they're just terrible, terrible. I, right, I, usually, I usually go through Arizona. So the, yeah, Elizabeth. They, they, they're very the, the guy and the woman. I forget her name. They're very good, and they go with the woodworking show. So yeah. you know, they, they, they were good. So, the, the other question I have, hey, uh, Rob, do, do you use a buffer at all when you do your pens? I have one. I don't normally. By the time I'm done, I use micro mesh. I right. I start off with uh, 150, 182, 23, 2400. Then I use triple E, E E E auto shine. And then I use the nine layers of uh, micro mesh, and then from there I'll use the sanding seal and friction polish. Right. So no, I, I do not use it when not after the micro mesh. Yeah, I have a buffer I use on mine. Yeah, um, I, I was, I've been starting to use it on the acrylics. I really haven't done it with the with the wood ones yet. I if I put C A, C -A on the um, like this has. This one here only has like one, maybe two coats of CA glue on it. Um, I'll, after I finish everything, I'll run it through the buffer with some buffing wax, and it big difference. Let me tell you, it makes it really shine, even with the CA. I pretty much, and then especially, yeah, your acrylics or your uh, Lumalite. Oh, you put those on the buffer, and it's like they look like glass before you. Um, I don't know that. No matter what I do, I don't think I can get. I'm not sure how you can see it. 
I don't think I could get a shinier using the buffer. I, I have the buffer, but I've never yeah. tried on my pins. I've tried on my bows and different Rob, things. Rob, you only have one buffer? No. <laughs> that is slacking. <laughs> I, I, have, I have the BL system that has all of them together, and then I have the BL system where you put in one at a time that you just put inside the chuck. But are, no, are no. there any tools you only have one of? <laughs> no, I do not have any tools. And in, in fact, as of Tuesday, I have a second chop saw. We went to Makita for a tour today of the Makita plant, and they had a really, really nice, brand new uh, Makita chop saw that's so much better. I love my Dewalt. But this was so much better as the dust collection and everything. On the way home where somebody else is driving, I set it there on my phone and ordered a, uh, a new one that'll be here Tuesday. So, no, I, I have no tools that I don't have two of. I got two planers, two band saws, three drill presses, you know. No. And a partridge in a pear tree. Two no, I don't like that. I don't like that. only one workshop. You, yeah. you only have one Steve Carmichael. Well, it counts as more than one. It's big. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is no mere workshop, believe me. <laughs> right, right, right. I still have my own workshop that was in the garage where I started off at. It, it is still serviceable. There you go. <laughs> We've lost like three or four panel members. They gave out on us and left us. So we're down to one, two, three, four, five of us, six of us with me. Well, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So, and we still got 38 people watching. And we, we had 80 something at one time. Googly, <laughs> moogly. Yeah, so I, that's I'm awesome. here. Uh, guys, uh, yeah, we're going to call it a night. We've been on here for almost two hours now, and I didn't expect to go. Uh, yeah, he who dies with the most tools wins. That's what Steve yeah. Good says. <laughs> My dad has that sign in his shop. Yeah, he's actually uh, out in the chat, Mr. Steve Good is. Hey, Steve, how you doing? I hope you have a good or having a good time up there at the, uh, and was it Dubuque at the uh, scroll saw thing? I want to be there. I wanted to go too. I just couldn't afford it uh, with everything going on around here. But all right, guys, uh, we've had a good time tonight. I think we've covered uh, immensely amount, and there's still more to even cover. We didn't even really get into all the tools. Uh, I mean, we got into somewhat chucks, pin turning bowls. Uh, we didn't get into all of it. And I want to tell you, um, you know, I probably got with my tools, uh, my new lathe. And I only paid sixteen hundred dollars for it, with all the chucks and everything. I probably got oh another thousand. I would say about another thousand over top of the sixteen hundred in the new lay. So tied up and all just all kinds of stuff that I bought for it. So yeah, I yeah, probably yeah. had a couple hundred of mine too. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's just incredible. When you start start talking about tools at like a hundred dollars a pop, uh, and you, it don't take, you know, four or five of them, and heck, you got five hundred dollars uh, tied up in tools. So yeah, I've got a lot of. Plus, then you go with the the thing that I've got. Yes, the pin press. So when you start talking about tying all that much money up, it's it's a rabbit hole, and it can get expensive. And you can keep on putting expense into it uh, real as much as you want to. But is it fun? You can start out a lot cheaper, though. You can uh, you can use the F clamps to put together to press as a press instead of buying a press. You can use a standard drill press and drill them up. You can drill them out by hand as long as you get it straight up. You know, if you got a three quarter inch blank and you're only doing seven millimeter, if you're not perfectly straight, by the time you start turning, it's going to be round anyway. So if somebody wants to try it out, and especially when you're looking for tools, you get the ones from Stone Mountain and the ones like you were showing earlier, uh, Savannah Tools and different ones like that. You can get a lot of those, uh, the cheaper ones, for about $13, $17, or something like that. You do not have to pay $100 and something dollars for the Sorby and different ones. You know, right. So it doesn't have, have to be that expensive. I have some Savannah Tools. Those were some of the first traditional tools that I actually bought. And I still use them. I like them. I mean, I, you know, they're not hard to sharpen. You know, they don't hold an edge as long as some of the more expensive ones. But I use them all the time. So there's nothing wrong with those. No, I'm not saying there is anything wrong. I'm just saying the sky's the limit as to what you want to put into it. It's right. Basically, if you want to start out cheap and go cheap in the beginning, then that's fine too. But you can also 
jack the price right on up in there. So, but um, we had, I think it was a great show. I, I really appreciate um, Paul was on here. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being here. Donna, she's already left. Who else? Were at? Russ Meadows. Michael. Yeah. Uh, Michael's still here. He ain't, I don't think he's. Yeah, he got up and walked away a little bit. Yeah, he got up and walked away. But anyway, thank you guys for all. And I've been so busy. I've tried to keep over there in the chat. Charles lost lost his uh, chat. But uh, Brian Warner has been out there in the chat. Tom Spillane, Inspired Woodworks, Wacky Woodworks, Al Forte, uh, David Hart, um uh, Tommy G. And that's another thing I wanted to point out there earlier, and Tom, uh, Charles mentioned it. Tommy G from Tommy G's Woodshop. Uh, give him a little plug is that he makes carbide tools also. Very uh, good tools. Yeah, handmade carbide yeah. tools. So if you're looking at carbide full size, mid size, and I think the uh, pen size, if you're looking to have some carb or wanting to buy some carbide tools and get in a really good um, quality tool that's handmade, uh, here we go. There you go. Uh, Michael's holding them up right there. Michael's yeah, got I, got them right I bought I bought them separated and I put them together. So I he, he sent the blank. I turned the blank. I glued the pieces in. He has them pre-made so that you can just buy them pre-made. And he's got all three sizes. So all three yeah. sizes. So there's like I said, if you're out there and you're looking at wanting to get some carbide tools and want a quality tool and made handmade. Go to Tommy G's Woodshop uh, dot com. I believe that's where it's at. But it's, yeah. just type in Tommy G's Woodshop on into Google, and you will find him. So, and I hope workshop or is yeah, it workshop? I, yeah, I can um, highly recommend him. I've got a set too, and I I don't think I've sharpened a tool since I got my Tommy G tool. Yes, Tommy G Workshop dot com. Tommy G Workshop dot com. So go check him out if you need some. Uh, uh, great show rush from Tim Roberts. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Uh, Tom Spillane still out there. Desert Bum Woodworking. Uh, Dan Inge Woodworking. Uh, Robert Evans, DF Craft Custom Woodworking still with us. Guys, we're going to call it a night. Uh, it's been two hours we've been on here, yeah. so I'm ready to go. So, And the uh, new song is Just Give Me Rob's Tools. All of Rob's Tools. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> just Give Me Rob's Shop. All of yeah. Rob's Shop. <laughs> Yeah, but then I can go out buy more when you're done, so no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of here. We only have one thing left to do, and there's Steve French is out there. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Uh, you're welcome, Tommy G. He said thanks. Uh, we only got one thing left to do, and that is just give me sawdust, lots of sawdust all around me and everywhere. I like it flying all around my shop and even in my beard and hair. Good night, everybody, and God bless. Okay. Bye, bye everybody. Well, you have to go home, but you can't stay here. Yeah, I'll stay here. We'll leave.